Hey guys, this is Aaron Carmen from AXC Electronic, back with the next video in our circuit analysis lecture series. So today what we're going to be talking about is AC power. Now AC power can be a little tricky. I didn't quite get it whenever I first learned this, but I'm hoping that after I explain this intuitively and kind of show you what I wish I would have known whenever I was first learning this stuff, that you might be able to understand this a little bit better. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of your way. Now, before we can start talking about power, the first thing we need to review a little bit is impedance. So impedance, Z, normally we write this in polar coordinates. So we write this with a magnitude and a direction. And that direction can either be, you know, an angle in radians or an angle in degrees. But what we can also do is we can write this in its rectangular form. So in its rectangular form, it's going to have a real part plus an imaginary part. So something multiplied by J. Now, you can see this is real plus imaginary, so this is its rectangular coordinates. What is this R? Okay, so let's, let's think about this intuitively. What can provide a purely real impedance? Well, the only component that we've talked about that provides a purely real impedance is a resistor. So we call this R resistance. Okay, so R is resistance, and it's a purely real impedance. Now, on that same foot, what is X? Okay. So what provides a purely imaginary impedance? Well, that's going to be either an inductor or a capacitor. So just to generalize this, what we call X, we call that reactance. Okay. Reactance, and that can either be an inductor's impedance or a capacitor's impedance. Okay. So the general term for that is reactance. So this is how we're going to write impedance in rectangular coordinates. And this is important because we're going to be using this later on whenever we're talking about power. So before we get into the frequency domain, let's look at just the time domain. So I'm gonna start here. We'll start off in the time domain. And the simplest case is just a voltage source and a resistor. So this voltage source is going to have Vs amplitude. And we don't really care about the frequency right now because we're just generalizing things. It's also gonna have a current I, and this is the resistance R. Now, if we plot this voltage and current versus time, I'll start off with voltage we'll see that it oscillates something like this. Okay. Now in a resistor, the current is just proportional to the voltage. It doesn't have any sort of phase shift at all. Okay, so the current is going to look, you know, something like this. So you can see that it's completely in phase with that voltage. It just has a different amplitude. So let's look at the power in this circuit at different times. So we're looking at the instantaneous time power or the instant power at any certain point. So let's look at this first section. In this first section, we have a positive voltage and a positive current. So naturally, that's going to give us a positive power here. All right. Now, this power changes over time, but it's still a positive power. Now, what about over here on the next section? Well, we have a negative voltage, but we also have that negative current. So that's, again, going to create a positive power over here. And this cycle just repeats. So you can see that no matter where we're at, we're always going to have this positive power. Let me make sure I denote current here. So now if I make another set of axes and I wrote out the power, okay? Power as we know it is just V times I, right? So let's do V times I for every point in, in time. And what we'll find is that it looks something like this. Okay, so it doesn't ever get below zero, but it touches zero some, at some points. So that's the power through this resistor. And you can also see that it's always positive, okay? So this power is always positive. That makes sense because we're dealing with a resistor that only dissipates power, right? Because everything we know is that resistors dissipate power. All right. So that means that power is always being consumed because positive power means we have power being dissipated. So what you'll see is that at different times, we have different power being dissipated, right? Because at this start, you know, we have really high power being dissipated. And over here, we have no power dissipated at all. So in order to move this to the frequency domain, what we do is we come up with something called the time average power. Okay, so time average power. So time average power is exactly what it sounds like, the average power over time. And for the sine wave, if we do this, we'll find that the average power is just equal to one half times the peak power. So that peak power is going to be, let me, let me say here, the peak power is going to be the peak voltage times the peak current. So here, the P time average or the time average power is just, oh, didn't mean to change pins there. That's going to be equal to one half VP times IP. 
okay, the peak values of voltage and current. So just as a little side note, uh, we can manipulate this equation to get 1 over square root of 2 VP times 1 over square root of 2 IP. Okay? And you can go backwards. If you multiply those 1 over square root of 2s together, you'll get that 1 half VP IP again. And what we can do is we can change this value to be V RMS times I RMS. So RMS stands for root mean square. And pretty much what this means is this is the average value of voltage and current over time. Okay, but since voltage oscillates around zero, the average power or the average voltage, if we thought about that, would, would be just about zero. Okay, but um, because we want to get the because we want to get a quantitative value, okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to do the root mean square. So what we do is we square the voltage. That'll make it always positive. We take the mean of that number, and then we take the root of that. Okay, sort of get back where we started. So this is. The root mean square just really gives you the kind of the average voltage and the average current. So VRMS times IRMS will give you P. And what's interesting is that the RMS value of voltage is uh, sort of describes the equivalent DC, the equivalent DC voltage. Okay. So remember, if we have a sine wave, it's going to change with time. But on average, it's going to deliver the same amount of power as a DC voltage with the RMS value of its voltage. So, for example, in North America, we have 170 volt peaks on our power, but we have 120 volt RMS. Okay, because if we do 1 over square root of 2 times the peak of 170, we get about 120. So that means that the voltage from our wall will deliver the same amount of power as a 120 volt DC source for any load. Okay, so the way you convert the RMS is just equal to 1 over square root of 2 times VP. So this is just a little aside to get you acquainted with RMS values because it, it's not super important for what we're going to do, but it is an important thing to know because you, you'll hear RMS a lot and it's important to know what exactly RMS is. Okay, so now that we've got that done, let's look at a capacitor or an inductor. Okay, so let's say we have, oh, didn't mean to switch again. So let's say we have a voltage source. Let's just say we have a capacitor, but this works with a capacitor and inductor. So we have Vs, this capacitor, and we're going to have an I flowing through it. Now, if we plot the values of voltage and current over time, voltage is going to look the same as it did previously. Let me sort of make sure I made it look somewhat similar. So let me uh, something like that. So voltage is going to look something like that. Now, in a capacitor, current leads voltage, or voltage lags current. So that means that the current is going to look something like this. Okay. And I didn't draw it exactly right, Okay, so I'm sure that there's ways to draw this better, but current's going to look something like that. It's 90 degrees phase shifted. Now what we'll find is that if we multiply the voltage and current at any or at all points in time, the power oscillates like this. Let me, let me use green since I used green before. The power will go up, up and down. So that means that a capacitor and inductor, it's going to store power for a little bit, and then it's going to release that power. Store it and then release it. So you can think of it like a slinky. If you move a slinky like this, you're going to be moving it back and forth, back and forth. That's all that's happening in a capacitor and inductor. You're moving power one way, and then it's moving back the other way in that oscillating fashion. Okay? So the time average power here is just zero. right? So let me write this here. PTA is just equal to zero. Because you can see here pretty easily that the average power that's being dissipated is zero watts. We store a little bit, but then we get some back, okay? So the time average power is zero. Okay, but there's still some current moving, right? There's still voltage and current moving here. So what we'll do is we'll call this reactive power. Okay? And we'll look at this more here in a second. Okay? So this is reactive power. Now, one note, quick note I want to make is that this is very different from the power in a resistor because the power in a resistor, like we said, it's we're going to call that real power or it's always positive power. Power through those resistors is going to create heat or it's going to you know create something that's useful to us. Okay. Now, this reactive power, we're just giving it to get it right back. So it's pretty useless for us. So we don't want reactive power. We want purely real power if that's possible. Okay. So now we have two different kinds of power, real and reactive. 
So we can switch to the frequency domain and get a you know a little bit different picture of what's going on. I'll use I'll use black to separate this. So now we're going to be in the frequency domain. So I'm going to start off by just giving you a formula, and then we can discuss it. So I'm going to say s, okay, s, s is equal to one half v i conjugate. So this s is called a parent power. And if you look at this equation, you can the way I think of it is that it's the power that's apparent to the source. Okay, we take the voltage, we take the current, and we multiply them together, multiply by one half because we want the sort of average power, and that's going to give us apparent power. Okay, so this doesn't really care about if it's real or complex, okay, because this is a complex value. What this is going to give us is a magnitude, so the magnitude of the apparent power, as well as a phase. Okay, so this is a complex value. So we know why we have that one half there. But why do we have this conjugate? So just before we start talking about that, I'll tell you, oops, move back over here. I'll tell you, if you have a vector x and you want to take the conjugate of that, okay, so here, let me, let me give you an example. Let's say x is equal to 10 with an angle of 30 degrees. x conjugate, all that is is 10 with an angle of negative 30 degrees. Okay, so you just flip the sign on the, uh, flip the, flip the sign on the phase. That's all you do to get the conjugate. So now let's look at a practical example. Okay, so let's say we have a resistor. So for a resistor, the voltage and current are going to be in phase. So this might be 10 with an angle of 30. And this could be 3 with an angle of 30. So resistors, we said, they're going to dissipate real power. So we're expecting the apparent power to be real. Okay, so what we'll find is if we get this, or if we do this, we'll get 15 with an angle of 60 degrees. Now, that 60 degrees, that means that this is inherently a complex value because it's not right on the real axis. Right? So if we drew the real axis here and the imaginary axis here, our power is like up this way. So it has a real part and an imaginary part. Well, if we have that, if we add that conjugate in there, so like this is this was saying if we didn't have this conjugate, this is the value we'd get. If we add that conjugate back in there, what we'll get is 15 with an angle of zero degrees. And this is more what we're expecting because this is going to be right on the real axis. So this is only real power. Okay, so that's why we have that conjugate there. That's just a little bit of an example. Like I said, you don't have to read too much into it. Just know that formula. Okay, so <clears throat> now let me just make sure I'm all caught up in my notes. So what we can do here is we can define a couple of other things. So I'm going to use P and Q. Now, P, that should immediately make you think power. Now, power in DC circuits, we used P. And in DC circuits, we only have real power. So P is just real power. So that's power that's being delivered to a resistor. And this is the useful type of power that's going to create like electromagnetic waves or mechanical motion or anything like that, stuff that's useful to us. Now, that should tell you that this Q is reactive power. So this is power that you know we're giving and then getting back, giving and then getting back. So this is pretty useless power because we're just getting it right back. We're not giving any energy to anything because we're giving that power right back. So this reactive power is pretty useless. So now this real power, like we said, DC circuits only have real power. So you've already been introduced to this. The real power is watts. Now for Q, it's reactive power. So we can't really use watts because watts is for real power. What we use is we use VAR. And VAR means volt amps reactive because if we do V times I, that's volt amps. And then the R denotes that it's reactive power, okay? So what we can also write is that S, which is the apparent power that we said before, S is just the sum of these two, okay? so real power plus J times the reactive power, because we said that that reactive power is purely imaginary. Okay? So this forms what we can call a power triangle. So let me draw complex axes here. So we have a real part and an imaginary part. And let's just say S is pointed like over here. It has an angle of phi and it's S. So it has that, it has a magnitude and it has that direction given by phi. Well, what we can do is we can say, well, this S is the same thing as 
a real vector, so a real power, plus an imaginary power, Q. So now you can see this forms just a nice little triangle, and we can use some trig identities to relate these values. So what we can say is that S is equal to the square root of P squared plus Q squared. That's just Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so that's pretty simple. What we can also do is we can say P is equal to S cosine theta. Oh, not cosine theta, we're using phi here. S cosine phi. Okay. And you can work that out for yourself to see how we got that. And Q is equal to S sine phi. So remember, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. And we can just rearrange in order to get the values of P and Q. Okay. So these are the formulas that we have in order to get the uh, in order to get the real power and the reactive power if all we know is the voltage and the current and their magnitudes and phases. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite some of these formulas now. So we have S is equal to 1 half VI conjugate. P is equal to S times cosine theta. So if we keep S, that'll be 1 half VI conjugate times cosine, I think I said phi, but it's co or I think I said theta before, it's cosine phi. And similarly, Q is equal to 1 half VI conjugate sine phi. And then we also have this formula that S is equal to P plus JQ. Okay? So, <clears throat> like we said, power, or the real power plus the reactive power is going to give us the apparent power. And we have all these formulas here that can relate all of them. You can use any of these that you want. Uh, it just depends on what you're given in the problem. Okay. So before we sort of wrap this up, there's one last quantity that I wanted to find, and that's going to be the power factor. So power factor. I'm just going to abbreviate this PF for now. So what we want from the power factor is that we want the power factor to relate the apparent power and the real power, because typically we're only concerned with the real power. Okay, so what we want is we want P, which is the real power, to be equal to PF times S. Okay. Now, if we look at this equation right here, no, let me clean that up a little bit. If we look at this equation right here, we will see that power factor has to be equal to cosine of phi. So power factor is limited between 0 and 1. So the maximum power factor is 1, the minimum is 0. Having a power factor of 1 means we're doing really good. We have only real power being delivered. We don't have any reactive power. And remember, reactive power is useless, so we don't have any of that useless power. We're only delivering that real power. And if we have a power factor of 0, that's really bad. We really don't want a power factor of 0. Okay. So lastly, I just want to summarize everything that we've talked about so far. So S, we said, is the apparent power. So S is the apparent power. You can think of that as the power that's apparent if you looked at just the voltage and just the current. So if you did V times I conjugate, that would give you the apparent power. And this is complex. So it has a magnitude and a phase. And it can be either uh, real, it could be imaginary, or it could be in between. Now the units for apparent power is just VA. Because it's not watts, it's not VAR, it's kind of the sum of those two, so we just look at it as VA, volt amps. Alrighty, so now we have P, which is real power. You could also think of this as useful power, right? Because this is the power that's going to do things like make electromagnetic waves, make mechanical motion, make sound, make heat. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, power is what's useful to you. Okay? And this is purely real. So having a real power means your voltage and current are perfectly in phase. That's going to create a real power. Units for this one, again, is just watts. That's something you should already know, but just in case, the units for this is watts. Now, the last thing that we have is Q. Let me make, I'll just keep everything in the frame here. So Q, this is reactive power. Okay, the way I think of this is this is useless power because it doesn't serve a purpose. We're just sending it to get it back. And this is purely imaginary. So this is meaning that the current 
and voltage are completely out of phase or 90 degrees out of phase. So this is purely imaginary, which is not good. We don't really want anything. We don't really want anything to do with reactive power. And the units for this one are VAR. And just as a last thing, I'll go ahead and draw that power or the power triangle for you. That way you can remember what it is and hopefully uh, commit this to memory. So we have S, which is a complex value. I'll, I'll make sure I denote that this is the real and imaginary axis. We have a real portion of that S, which is P, and a imaginary portion of that S, which is Q. And then this angle between S and the real axis is phi. Okay. So guys, I hope you learned something here. I know that this topic is kind of confusing. In the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some actual examples. So some actual circuit examples and see what we mean by real and reactive power and sort of what happens in these circuits. Okay, so if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Like I said, I know this material can be confusing. I'm happy to answer any questions if it means that you're going to have a better grasp of this material. Okay, if you like this content, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe for more. And otherwise, I'm Aaron Carmen, and thank you for watching.